G'day everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Australian Property Investment Podcast. I'm your host, Aaron Christie David. I run a mortgage broking business called Atelier Wealth, where we specialize in helping property investors start out and scale up their property portfolios. Uh, and in true fashion, we bring in a guest, what I call a best in breed, so someone who lives, eats, breeds, sleeps, all things property related. And I'm going to be very biased today that someone here is best in breed, uh, because today in the studio, we've got my wife, business partner, Bernadette. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Aaron. Not at all. We've got, we got a lot to talk about. And it's I'd say it's almost, uh, what's the word? It's almost poetic that we're here. So we, we record our podcast in a great studio in North Sydney. And we literally got married around the corner 10 years ago. That's right. <laughs> I know. We're coming up to our 10-year wedding anniversary. And uh, gosh, how much time has fl- flown and how much we've experienced together. Isn't it? Yeah. It, it's amazing. And uh, I'm not going to sit here and make this about us, but um, I think for a lot of people, when you pause and reflect on what ha- truly happens in a decade, and I think there was that great scene that when we went to Tony Robbins, people overestimate what they can do in a year, but underestimate how much they can do in a decade. Yes. If we just kind of recap what the last 10 years has looked like for us, back then, we would have had two investment properties. Two investment properties. We mm-hmm. were both working corporate. Yeah. Renting in Little Bay. Yep. Uh, and then not long afterwards, I decided that I want to step out into mortgage broking and, and had a mortgage choice franchise for some time there as well. Yes. Uh, but we had aspirations to grow. And now where we are with the with the business, Atelier Wealth has been going for seven years. Um, we've bought our own home. Uh, we've got a commercial near self-managed super fund as well. Uh, we bought Little Bay, sold Little Bay, sold yeah. our other investment properties as well. But the reason that we want to bring this episode to you today, again, not to talk about us, is to talk about a little bit of our journey, but our most rec- recent acquisition. And I think it's a, it's a super important one because we deal with a lot of self-employed, and particularly I say, wait, I say you, yep. we do a lot of self-employed uh, borrowers. And one of the big uh, bugbears is paying rent. And I think we've got to the point in our business where rent had served us, but what got us here will not got us, get us to the next level of our, our growth and Absolutely. our wealth plans as well. And we said, right, how do we kind of stop paying rent, buy our own commercial property? And this is very much largely driven by our business coaches as well at Abundance Global going, we need to get into the asset building mindset and rent just wasn't serving us in that sense. So we said, right, how do we set about buying our own commercial property and so we looked at do we do we put down our roots in the cbd which is where we are traditionally or do we move to a, a location close to us which homes in winuna uh do we try and buy something in the northern illawarra suburbs and we said right let's get to work there's no commercial property to buy absolutely <laughs> i think that was the biggest frustration and we were looking sort of i'd say passively for about a good six to eight months just watching and seeing okay what seeing was coming what's on. coming on the market and it was it was crickets it was underwhelming yes. it was underwhelming and uh there was we could have bought but i'm like we would outgrow this in within a year or two it's like okay this is this is clearly not going to serve us for long term but and i think that's important with commercial to jump in is like it's um about the long term play so it's not necessarily about where your business is at now but where your business is going to be in maybe five ten years time correct and you got to really kind of put that that uh, pen to paper go okay what does the growth look like? What do we think we're going to get from a run rate perspective in terms of financials? Yeah. What can we afford to buy now that won't like bleed the business till we kind of turn a corner? But then where's it going to give us time to grow and, and put down roots for this business? So yeah. before we do continue, I want to especially uh, I want to uh, make a note that this conversation is general in nature and not intended to give advice. So if you do need advice, please seek out a professional as well. So what I want to do is kind of take us through maybe a three or four step process. So we'll talk about the search. We'll talk about the buying and then we'll talk about settlement and beyond. So mm. uh, like you said, passively looking at the market, not much going on there. We then turn to our buyer's agent, Jack Corbett. Yep, at Corbett Buyer's Agency. Yeah, yes. great, great local guy. And we said, Jack, we're, we're frustrated. We want to try and buy a commercial. There's not much on the market. Can you just put the feelers out to see if anyone is interested? We want to get a first bite at the cherry. And even then there wasn't much. There just really wasn't much stock. I mean, just to uh, 
geographically specific, our closest sort of city is Wollongong. Yeah. Uh, we didn't. We did not personally want our office to be based there, just because it is about 20, 30 minute commute from our home, and we wanted something a lot more local and a lot more um, centric to the community that we live and work in. So as we we're looking, we reached out to Jack, and something did pop up. It was a vacant block of land, uh, and Jack decided, you know, he went in there for us and, and made an offer. Uh, as we went through that process, uh, it became apparent as we were doing our due diligence, there was a contamination report on the land, yeah. which requires significant remediation works. You know, it could be up into the thousands and that was an immediate red flag for us. Although it was wonderful because it was a, you know, a vacant block, we could just, we could build whatever we wanted on it, um, you know, extend um, build other sites possibly so we could sublease, it wasn't right for us. We, we knew that we couldn't, we didn't have the pockets to make, do that remediation yeah. work. So we had to say goodbye to that property. Yeah. But I think what, what the beauty of that process was, it got us into the gear, the gear of getting finance organized, mm. uh, going through contract reviews, what type of entity are we going to buy this? And then how, what do the numbers look like in terms of stacking up? And the hardest part, I guess, with valuations on this type of vacant block there's no vacant blocks from a commercial perspective in around the areas to benchmark it. So we had to, I don't know, just a guesstimate to kind of work out what our offer was going to be. Right? Well, that's right. And I think when you move into commercial, it really becomes about the square meterage rate. So how big is the site? What is the square meterage? Is it 200, 300 square metres? And then how much typically have uh, comparable properties sold for would that have a similar space and, and likeness to the property? Yeah. So you really have to start to pull up some of that, those comparables. You're know, speaking to your commercial agents in your area to get a bit of a feel for what is the going rate as well. Yep. Yep. So we missed out on that opportunity and we said, look, we didn't miss out. We tried nothing ventured, nothing gained, mm -hmm. but at least we're, we're, we're moving forward on this as well. Yeah. And then uh, by engaging Jack, then we said, look, is there anyone else that's interested? And it just so happened there was a, a really great real estate agency uh, local that were looking to buy as well. They were running out of room, similar dilemma to what we had. And it's like, awesome. If we join forces, potentially we're going to get economies of scale here. They've got a good budget. We've got a good budget as well. Can we potentially find something? And then lo and behold, this awesome opportunity Absolutely. came up that we saw. Yeah. That's right. So it's, it's, it's a big site. It's just shy of 800 square metres. Yep. So nowhere could we, our business, fill that and occupy that now and, and nowhere, uh, nowhere could their business either. And in partnership together, we're like, we can go in with our combined budgets by this site uh, and, you know, I'm going to be really – um, truthful, it's an ugly duckling. Like there's no way to sugarcoat. <laughs> we'll try and get it brought up onto the screen. So if you're, if you're tuning in audio, jump onto the YouTube and have a look at the, um, the video. So I'll bring up on the back screen in a second. And yeah, it's what's, what's the saying by the worst house on the best street, or we bought the worst commercial on a pretty good street. That's exactly in the, right. In, in the town center. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, to look at it, it's not much, but we, we could see the opportunity because of the size of the frontage that the property had and of the ability for us to inject money to, to upgrade it. We are going to see the return, we hope, in terms of an uplift in a commercial valuation. Yeah. Um, so that's, you know, a lot of the key drivers there. Yeah, correct. So, yeah, we played the long game. Uh, when we looked at the numbers, uh, yeah, it was uh, it was a sizable commitment. And so when we're talking commercial, how, so I guess we'll go into the the structuring on how we put together this deal. Mm. So co-purchase co it. So when you've got two different companies that are buying, we've each got to go in and kind of find a commonality in terms of our buying entity yep. right so take us through how you set that up yeah that's right so um, each business has set up their own unit trust so fixed unit trust and we've bought it together as a partnership now our intention is to ultimately fit it out divide it and then do a subdivision so we can then split the asset and uh, the, the real estate agency and us can have our own separate titles. Yep. So it, it's, it is, you know, we're going to keep you posted as we go through this journey because we're learning a lot. Um, so strata subdivision uh, at the moment going through, well, we might get to the CDC approval. And yeah, so a bit going later. through, 
going through the expressions of interest, and this was, again, another hard one, which is how do we value it? So we've got a real estate agency that's like perfect. They know residential, but the commercial, again, is a different skill set. And yeah. we're like, how do we value this thing? Like age, working with the agent, negotiating. Again, we did the same thing, work out four meter, um, square, square, meterage. square meterage dollars. Here's what we think it's going to be worth. Do we add a sweetener on top of that? So we just kind of pay whatever we need to to avoid competition from a negotiation perspective. So that you you would try and to there were a couple of there were a couple of things that the vendor wanted. So the vendor wanted to exchange in the new financial year, and the reason they wanted to exchange in the new financial year is because when the date you exchange is the date that you pay capital gains. Yeah. So if we exchanged, we were talking negotiation started around April May. If we exchanged, then he would have to have paid capital gains for this financial year. He wanted to push it out to next financial year. So their recommendation was to lock the price down, but to ensure that it'll exchange in the year he wanted was to put a put and call option on the property. So put and call is option is where we as the purchasers and them as the vendors agree to a price. We sign an option agreement and we pay our option fee. The option fee is basically the 10% deposit, but we just pay it at the time of signing the option. Put and call. Um, put means we have the ability on the on the date agreed to put it on the vendor to exchange the contract. And then the call option is where the vendor has the ability to call on us to exchange and that's an agreed time frame which was set in the new financial year which was all detailed in the option agreement. So we're essentially paying our 10% deposit but it's called an option fee and we're going to exchange in the new financial year. So we're going to lock it down then. Benefit for us was we've locked in the price three months prior to us actually exchanging. So if there are any fluctuations in price, if the market is moving up, it's a really good way for you to secure your property and the price of the property and, and let that ride out. And that enabled us and gave us time to work with our, um, our banker, our broker, me as the broker, and then our NAB banker to get our finance in order and to start the design process for the fit out. Yeah, exactly right. And then the finance Working on commercial finance, for example, is very different to residential. So residential is you've got a set of rules, for example, here's bank policy, here's a calculator. Yes, if it's policy, therefore we'll lend you. Whereas working in commercial, and this is primarily the bulk of your work, commercial self-employed SMSFs, for example. So working with a commercial banker, they might say no originally. And then by working together, understanding the business, understanding the long-term play, what the site's going to look like, that no becomes a maybe and that maybe then becomes a yes once we found the site, right? So take us through that evolution of working with – and we had a really great banker. Shout out to Justin, uh, Justin Allenby over at, at NAB. Yeah, um, absolutely. Just really, I guess, this is where that power of – it's not a level playing field. You get another business in there that goes – they might take, they take that no and feel dejected. Yeah. You initially came back with that no. It's like, I don't know, I think we can – we've got real belief in this. Yeah. We've got real belief in this. What do we need to do to make this work? Absolutely. The beauty of commercial is it's not black and white. Mm. It's very subjective and there are a lot of grey areas. And and why I like it is because we can tell a story. So if we can show there's a couple of things, if we can show your historical figures of the business last two, three years, we can show a growth trajectory. We can tell a story about what the business has been doing. The beauty is you can also provide forecasts. So you can actually say, okay, based on our growth trajectory that we've had historical, we can now look forward on our forecasts and say, hey, this is where the business will be in, two, in one, possibly two years time. So if we, if we have that power, we can show the banker, this is a solid business and you can tell the story about what you're doing to invest and grow your business. So for us, when it was initially a no, it was based on historicals. And then and then what we did is we built out, or I built out the forecast yeah. for the business. I also then pulled together, I don't, I'd call it like a mini business plan. Yeah. And it would it broke down our business 
into six core strategy areas. So what are we doing on vision and leadership? What are we doing about product innovation? What are we doing for our our leads, our marketing? How are we, you know, servicing our clients and then ultimately, um, you know, delivering and and giving that client, our client success and being able to map out those sort of key areas in our business, tell the story about the strategy for each of those engine rooms in the business was something that it really showed and proved to the bankers, hey, this is a legit business. This is serious. They're invested in their growth. And then through the purchase of this commercial property, we can see that they're going to have uplift because of, you know, productivity output, you know, more ability to have house more people in their business. So that's how we turn the no into a yes. So yeah. commercial is, it's it's exciting in one way because you can tell a story. Yeah. And you, you put that, same deal in front of two different mortgage brokers, I'm not going to compare, but just as a pure story, you put that in front of two different brokers, you'll get a different result. And initially it was a no. I said, no, 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 there's conviction in this. Yes. And they, yeah. and they fed off that level of conviction. It's like if there's true belief in this business, then let's relook at it. And so if you've been told a no, don't, don't be disheartened. Find someone else that's going to truly going to bat for you mm. and find the right banker that's going to go into bat for you as well because the banks are there to lend. Mm. They want to find people to lend to. They've just got to have the right business. And I think this is something if you're um, a commercial, if you're a business owner, you're investing in commercial property, residential property, it, it, it doesn't matter. But if, if you have the belief then you need to find that team that also believes in you and will support that vision. Yeah. And and don't be shy. Like if you have a vision, whatever it is, build your pro- property portfolio to X, build your business to X, the people that you have around you, tell them your vision. Because if we know what you want to achieve, we can actually, we, we're there on the journey and we can help to correct. facilitate that. Yeah, correct. And that's what you want. You want people that are pro and supporting your business growth and your, your future ambitions, which that's something that we've learned firsthand. It's like, don't project a lot of people project their own insecurities. It's like, well, hang on, this is bigger than this is bigger than us. And so we go through the finance process. Yep. The entities in itself. So we bought through our fixed unit trust yep. as the buying entity. Uh, let Let's just be open about it. Be prepared for a mountain of paperwork yeah, for <laughs> and sure. meetings with lawyers and accountants. And you obviously took that that uh, monkey on your back and handled the whole thing. But that is a time and energy consuming part of the process but it's it's mandatory like you just can't buy the property without the time and energy investment so be prepared uh to put away the time and the energy to understand how we buy in this what entity tax implications for the future as well and then what does this mean from a personal asset protection and we're going through a whole wills and estate planning which i think is another conversation for you and i to talk about Mm. in terms of personal protection so then we get to settlement. Yep. Yep. And given that we had that extended settlement in the background, we're doing some work on the actual site yes. as well. So take us through what happens, CDCs, council, you know, DAs, how have we navigated that process as well? Of course. So when you're buying a commercial property and you intend to fit it out for your business purposes or fit it out for someone else to rent it out from you, you've got two forms of approval. You can go through CDC. Uh, as an approval. So it's a private certifier that will look at your plans and then they are the one that give you the tick of approval to go ahead and and fit this property out. The other option is counsel through a DA. Now, for obvious reasons, uh, most people like to avoid counsel. Um, They serve a great purpose for a lot of things. Um, Approving uh, commercial fit outs is not one of their strongest and quickest turnaround times that that they're able to provide. So we've been actively pushing to get a CDC approval in place. Um, This has been something I've been learning as we've been going through the process. Every certifier is different. First, the first certifier we spoke with um, didn't want to or told us to go to a DA and that was because of the size of the property and traffic uh, issues. Uh, We then spoke to another certifier and that wasn't a concern for them as long as we addressed a couple of issues. So um, if one certifier says no, it's not a no for every certifier. So it's really getting recommendations, um, speaking to all different sorts of certifiers, if you know of people who have used them in the past, who is the best one for us? Yeah, spot on. Great advice. And 
you know, going through this, you've obviously got someone else on the other side that, that we've co-purchased with as well to share a little bit of that load, but that just means we're managing more stakeholders. We're all right. So yeah, absolutely. Uh, and then trying to manage manage the budget on top, <laughs> on top of this. So it's probably the next big one, which is how are we going about budget allocation for a fitter and what are those costs changed, evolved, look like and how are we managing uh, yeah, keeping absolutely. it under a certain limit as well? For, for us, the budget was uh, decided on um, discussions with the other party that we purchased with. They'd recently done a fit out for one of their offices and they said, oh, the fit out cost us about... Um, yeah, we're sharing numbers. Go for it. Okay. The budget uh, for their fit out costs them around 350 ish. Yeah. And we we're like, okay, great. It's a similar size when we divide the, the property in half. So we're going to budget around 350, but we actually got about 450 for our, you know, contingencies. We're going through the process of speaking with builders and shop fitters now, and, and it is looking like it is about double that at the moment. So it's been a real shock to us. One, we don't have that budget, and two, we are going to have, if that is the case and we can't find someone who can meet us a bit closer, we're going to have to restructure our finance. So that means talking again to our, our banker advising what's happening it might need to be under um, commercial development finance so it's entering a new realm as well Um, but it's not impossible now the way that they'll look at it now is the commercial property they'll look at it as it is they'll then have a look at the building plans and then they'll value it on an as if complete valuation and then they'll lend to 70 percent of that so we're still not going to get the full 100 percent of the the costs that we need, yeah. we'll get 70% and we're going to have to kick in the extra 30% ourselves. Yeah, perfect. So if we look on the screen, this is the property that we've got. So like I say, if you, if you want to jump onto the video format, you'll see it uh, in live. And obviously it's great um, advertising because I've heard about NAB being our business banker and <laughs> suddenly they're on advertising on the right-hand screen. But that's a separate AI conversation, I feel, or good so targeting. So we, we weren't uh, lying about it being ugly ducky, <laughs> uh, ugly duckling. Um, it, it's 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 very tired building. Previously, in a past life, uh, it was IGA. Um, that IGA has been gone for a few years. It was then a video easy that they've then gone. It was then at the front used as a medical center up to about sort of here, and then the back of that was actually just left vacant for a number of years. Mm. So you know, you walk into the property it has a very musty smell. Um, there's you know pipes and Jip rock and just empty cool rooms, empty cool rooms. And, you know, you walk in, you go, wow, this is, this is a lot of work, but if we can see the upside and we can lift the value of this by adding out, fit out, bringing our, our business into this premises, not only is because it has such a a large shop frontage shop meterage, it's going to lift the town, the town center as well. Correct. And that's what we wanted. We wanted to come into a site where we could see the upside, but also lift the community as well. I think any good any good development, whether it's resi or commercial, will have that effect where it's like you're now raising the bar on, on it. So as we kind of scroll through, um, you'll see this is the location. So it's yeah, it's in the suburb called Wanuna. It's on Princess High, which is you know a really great thoroughfare. Uh, and then that's the site. So while the we share that, com- that car parking with uh, the other couple of businesses on the strata, uh, there's ample car parking around, say, for team members and for clients coming through there as well. Uh, yeah, this was the inside. Um, yeah, some, some creative interior design work there is what the colour schemes. But again, it's like when people go through and they see, oh, I don't like the walls. It's like, who cares about the walls, mate? They'll be gone or they'll be repainted. So there's that ability just to see past what it is in its current iteration to what it will be in the future as well. And um, so to us, the inside became irrelevant. And the other part is, and this is where you get resourceful. Um, uh, we put it out there on like, uh, I want to say we, one of the other partners in, in the purchase, put it out there for people to come through and take whatever they wanted. We're talking like joinery. We're talking the walls. Sinks. W- sinks, whatever you wanted. Come and help yourself. And the amount of people that came that could upcycle a lot of the fit out meant that it just didn't go into land waste. Mm, uh, correct. And, and cost for us to demo the building as well. So it's such a win-win going, if you can just be resourceful, someone's going to see value in you know, the, the gyprock, the joinery, the metal, 
We, we had a guy come out. He was building his home in a bushfire-prone area, so his um, base needed to be metal, not wood. And he came out and he said, hey, can I pull down the gyprock and take all the metal out? And we're like, yeah. Go nuts. It's all yours. Yeah. So, yeah, people, especially I would say now, I think people really are looking to – um, how can we how can we do more recycling? How how can we be a little bit more resourceful? I think absolutely instead of just like th- building something new, throwing it into the trash. Yep, yep. And then uh, and I think that's you know it's going to a great home. So that's that's been part of it. So we've got to how do we how do we locate? How did we negotiate settlement? How do we fit it out? So we're going to keep you updated on our journey. We want to be you know, we've often we've often talked about clients' portfolios. We often bring in guests that share about what they're doing um, for their own clients as well. But I guess for us, we're, we're just like everyone else that's listening. We're on our own wealth journey. We're trying to build our own portfolio. We're trying to build intergenerational wealth through property and commercial for us became a very good vehicle, not only for the business, but also personal asset building as well to go, right, it has future upside that the zoning, I think, allows for units to be developed on top as well. That's uh, right. So, again, it's, it's the site became strategic going not only for now and for the business, but potentially at some point in the future if we had the inkling to then uh, build on top, the site allows for it, which we thought, hey, that's a bit of an X factor mm-hmm. too. So uh, watch this. We'll keep you updated with the progress. It's something that we're, you know, we're being really excited about as well. We're speaking about it. And I think for us we've finally got to the point that we can um, confidently say, We've got a good foundation with our own home. Mm-hmm. Um, we've bought investment properties. We haven't been afraid to sell them and trade up, for example. And it's a strategy that we're we're fine tuning as we go through. And we've been, you know, really, um, we've been really fortunate to be privy to a lot of clients in their own wealth building journey. And everyone has a different style or a different risk appetite. But for us, we're like, hey, in 20 years' time, would we have regretted missing out on this? And we said, yeah, I think we would uh, if we didn't pull the trigger on it. So credit to you, Bernie. I know that I came out with some crazy ideas and you've been able to execute on, on quite a few of them. And um, I think you touched on it. The self-employed person that wants to find their own commercial site, you've got a real good track record of doing that as well, right? Absolutely. And I, and I just it's, – it's like it's like renting for your business, why would you rent for your own business if your business has the ability to buy the asset? So not only do you own the asset that your business operates in, um, you pay rent not to someone else, you pay rent to pay down that that loan, that asset loan. So uh, a lot of my savvier uh, business owners, self-employed clients start to look at that at some point in their journey because they can see that they're basically paying rent to someone else yeah. for their business premises. And it becomes very lucrative, right, when you look at the tax implications and the benefits. So, yeah, definitely something uh, we recommend our self-employed clients look into. And you can build your business how you want to. Like the style now reflects how you want to build your business, whereas if you're renting, you're hamstrung in terms of what this what this site can do for you and your business. Like you want to put a fit out in there. It's like it's great, but why don't we outgrowing the site or two where we're just improving someone else's well, asset? Well, that's the thing. If you're paying $500,000 for a fit out or more and it's not your property, yeah, you might be able to strip some of that back when you leave, but you've that's a big sunk cost yeah. into a property that you don't own. Mm. Like that's a big thing. And I think people go into fit outs and, and sort of go, yeah, great, and, you know, spend the money. Um, but when you don't own that asset, when you leave that site in your contract, you might have a make good clause. So that's where you have to strip everything out and leave it how leave the property how it was, which it. is another cost as well. Correct. And if you don't own that asset, then that's you know cost on top of cost. Yeah, and depending on business you've got, if you're in that location, you've built your reputation, and suddenly by the the owner wants to sell it, or they're increasing the rent, you know, it comes up to a renewal term. Now your business is hanging off the back of someone else's decisions. And mm. it's like, don't leave it to chance. If you can afford to buy or you're thinking about buying, let's have a conversation. Absolutely. Because I think even just having that conversation may not be now, maybe one or two years' time, but at least you're thinking about assets instead of simply your business being the asset. You're thinking about other leverageable assets as well. And I think also thinking about buying commercial property for your business 
puts you into a different mindset. So some business owners I speak with, they're about showing no profit so they pay no tax. That's a very, I would say it's a very scarcity mindset mentality. When you're thinking about, oh, can I actually buy this property that we run our business in? Okay, how much income and revenue do we need to make? How much profit do we need to earn? Okay, how do we how do we get that, you know, 30 or 20% deposit to buy that asset? This puts you into an abundance mindset. This put this puts you into a growth mindset. It puts you into a uh, a property portfolio building mindset and I think that's so important. I I I would much rather pay tax and have profit and cash left over than have no profit, no cash and pay no tax. Mm. I am happy to pay tax if it means I have cash in the bank to pay my employees, to grow my business, to then invest in assets for for our family. I think that is something that I really want to talk to business owners about because we put ourselves into a growth mindset. We can hire more people. We serve more clients. We add more value into the economy and it, it just continues to grow and scale. Well said. Well said. I don't think I can top that, so we'll leave that there. I might lose my rate. I might lose my seat as the host on this soon. Um, <laughs> don't think but so. Watch, we'll watch this space with interest. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to say thank you, Bernie. I really appreciate you coming in, sharing the journey. Uh, guys, we're an open book. So if you've got any questions about how we've done this, uh, how we financed it, and I've got to say going through the financing, just to kind of cap off on this, there are so many banks that have different policies. I mean, we could drop like, to the whole value of our, our home and then buy the commercial property as well, depending on the, on the loan to value ratio. And I think we were even we were pleasantly surprised about being the business owners trying to buy this asset. Banks that were going, hey, look, we've got this product and it's slightly uh, flexible using our own home as well. Not not kind of tying it all in, but going, there's equity there that we can leverage and, and access as well. So, yeah, there's plenty of ways to skin this cat. Uh, if you're thinking about it, if you're commercial curious, please do reach out. We'd love to have a chat and Bernie can be your uh, your... your uh, Guide. lead on that as well <laughs> um, thanks very much for tuning in if you found this helpful please leave us a review uh, give us a thumbs up and subscribe for more and until next time take care